Hello, my name is Milena Sebasto. I'm a psychotherapist working within ABL Health and I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm welcoming you to listen about some important aspects of living with chronic pain and how challenging it is to make lifestyle changes with it. And first of all, congratulate yourself on starting the journey with our service. And please take one step at a time with this journey. In this webinar, I will talk you through some important considerations as you are approaching the lifestyle change and to remind you to look after you at every step of the way. And we are here to support you as best as we can. So to start, I'd like to start off with a little bit of science of chronic pain. So research uh, shows that chronic pain can have wide reaching impacts on physical and mental health and chronic pain can interfere with normal brain activity, suppressing brain function, such as motor coordination and learning. And chronic pain can also disrupt the normal pain's communication by causing sensitivity. So that even when the injury or illness that caused the initial pain ceases, the pain may endure. And widespread muscle pain and tenderness is the hallmark symptom of fibromyalgia. The pain can vary in intensity and at times can be excruciating and unbearable. So besides having pain, there are a number of secondary symptoms or comorbidities associated with the disease, such as depression, anxiety, tension headaches, fatigue, loss of sleep and irritable bowel syndrome. The reality life and with fibromyalgia can be debilitating, but it doesn't have to be. And we know that patient care that involves the biopsychosocial model can pro has proven to be quite effective for helping patients live with fibromyalgia. And um, we also know that care providers who use the biopsychosocial model to help uh, patients suffering from fibromyalgia uh, utilize medical treatments, obviously massage therapy, physical therapy, and behavioral health uh, strategies. Sometimes medications are used to help the pain and symptoms. Um, and although we know that researchers still don't know the exact cause of origin of fibromyalgia pain, the onset can often be traced back to trauma or injury. We know that living in constant pain can cause, of course, poor sleep or relationship strain, inactivity, decreased motivation, and ultimate can cause distress, anxiety, and depression, which have been proven to worsen pain. And this leads to a vicious cycle of chronic pain, and the cycle, of course, cannot be broken without the intervention. Um, other issues, as you can see on the on the slide, um, other issues associated with chronic pain may include limited energy levels, difficulty with focus and concentration, or so-called brain fog. Um, it can interfere with sexual activity or definitely add up to emotional distress or social deprivation because of it. Um, so how chronic pain impacts daily life? Uh, while most people have unlimited energy to complete their daily responsibilities, including getting up in the morning, doing household chores, going to work and maintaining a social life. Of course, people with chronic pain have limited energy to perform those activities and responsibilities without triggering the a pain flare up. So chronic pain patients walk in a fine line between underexertion and overexertion when it comes to their daily engagement with activity. 
And underexertion means avoiding activities for fear of triggering pain and exhaustion. Uh, and on the other hand, overexertion is when you engage in excess activity, which can trigger a pain flare up that impacts your capacity for days to come. So chronic pain equals good days and bad days. Most people with chronic pain experience good and those bad days as their pain intensity varies depending on the day. On a good day, we, some people tend to overwork, which is followed by several days of crashing or feeling fatigued and in pain. So to avoid these extremes, people have to learn to balance their activity level each day, minding their limited energy and not exceeding their daily limits of activity. So there's a couple of things I want to uh, walk you through, which is first starting off with mastering the art of pacing. So listen, pacing is basically just slowing down until your activity level is a better match for your energy level. It is a simple concept, but with most of us having hectic lives on very little downtime is a tough goal to achieve. Chronic illnesses doesn't the chronic illness doesn't change the fact that we have certain things that just have to get done. Uh, what we generally do is push ourselves to do everything on good days. The problem with that is you might then end up laid out for the next three days because you did more than your body could have handled. And this is sometimes called the push, crash, push cycle. And it is important to break out of that. Several pacing techniques can help you manage your responsibilities in a way that better safeguards your well-being. So by incorporating them into your daily life, you can learn to get things done while staying within your energy limits. And there is no reason to push yourself to the point of exhaustion. Learn to set realistic expectations and pace yourself throughout the day. Doing these two things will help you make it through the day without feeling defeated. And I'd like you to introduce you into Spoon Theory. So some of you probably have uh, already seen this before. So we, of course, know that being in pain is exhausting. And if you live with chronic pain and you might find yourself having to carefully manage your daily activity levels to accommodate and anticipate your pain levels, that pain and the logistics of managing it have, can have an impact on your mental and physical health. Um, so let's see, let's look at the spoon theory, which was developed in 2003 by writer Christine Miserandino um, to explain how um, having lupus impacts her ability to perform daily tasks. Ms. Arandino created this analogy about having a limited number of daily spoons. So people with chronic pain, she says, start each day uh, with a set of proverbial spoons, each one representing the physical and mental energy it takes to complete a daily task or activity. Smaller tasks like showering or getting dressed might cost only one spoon, while larger tasks like cooking or hoovering may take three or four spoons. On days with increased pain, even smaller tasks might require multiple spoons. So the spoon theory is a self-pacing strategy that emphasizes um, they need to uh, for chronic pain patients to work on a certain quota. Um, patients have to be economical in how they spread the use of their spoon in their daily activity. 
Um, and you probably have heard uh, the word spoonie. Uh, so again, a spoonie is a person who um, lives with chronic pain and subscribe to spoon theory, uh, which may, and sometimes they may refer to themselves as spoonies, but the term isn't limited to on any one medical, medical condition. Uh, rather, of course, it's a way for anyone who lives with chronic pain to explain the way they're, they ration their energy based on their illness. So some chronic illnesses, of course, that can be associated with chronic pain can include back pain, of course, fibromyalgia, uh, lupus, migraines, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and remember that spoon theory isn't just for people with physical illnesses. It can also be a helpful way for people with mental conditions, including anxiety and depression. Um, and really, it, it helps us to think about our daily capacity and apply that level of compassion and really be very assertive that perhaps, you know, using all your spoons and pushing yourself to, to do that perhaps might not be very kind to yourself and your body. Um, and as you can see on the slide, that when we run out of our spoons, we borrow spoons from the next day. That's why the effect of loss of energy can obviously be something we pay for later on, maybe not being able to move for a couple of days after. Okay, so how can we manage uh, the spoons? So I think this is kind of very important that, that even though chronic pain cannot be cured, there are strategies and treatments that can help you learn to live with it. And we know the research shows that with the right interventions, chronic pain uh, can improve uh, your tolerance uh, of the pain and restore your normal functioning or good enough functioning. So we've got here some examples, um, physical therapy, for example. So seeing a physiotherapist for pain management can teach you exercises and other strategies to strengthen your body and less, lessen your pain. Meditation, medication. So, of course, your doctors or your medical team may prescribe medications to treat your chronic pain, uh, as well as to address the depression, anxiety that often accompany it. Uh, psychotherapy. Research, of course, shows that therapy can um, help people with chronic pain learn to better cope with the ways and their condition impacts their life. And of course, mindfulness meditation, this kind of psychological intervention can help patients develop an accepting attitude towards their pain. And we have some examples within service of some mindfulness meditation. And I'd like to, you to maybe have a look at that and explore if this is something you'd like to try. There's of course complementary medicine, combining conventional treatment with some alternative therapies such as acupuncture, massage or chiropractic care, which can all alleviate some of your pain. And of course, pain management programs. Um, if you haven't heard of these, please speak to your GP and have a look at if this is something you could explore for yourself as well. So. Based on the cause, of course, uh, and nature of your pain, uh, very much a comprehensive interdisciplinary approach is needed. One that can combine some medica medication or physical therapy, or as well as psychotherapy or counseling um, can help you uh, to rehabilitate and restore your function. Of course, uh, in terms of the right interventions and therapies, uh, we do see that the quality of life can be really improved uh, with the use of these. So in terms of kind of a little bit more uh, advice or, or guidance in terms of how you can look after yourself within our program, um, this is where I'll be looking into eating uh, and obviously how important it is to approach your eating from quite holistic and, and compassionate approach. Um, so maintaining a healthy enough diet with foods that are packed with vitamins, nutrients, fiber, and drinking plenty of water. A research recommends eating the following foods, for example, um, which we've got here, 
um, like salmon, black beans, nuts, seeds, dark leafy greens and colorful fruits and vegetables. And if you haven't yet, perhaps it's time to cut out the bad toxins like smoking and drinking alcohol. I know that these sometimes help us cope with the difficulty of, of being in pain. However, these also can exacerbate some of the sim symptoms. So it's very important that you look into it and there is help. So if you wanted to speak to one of our advisors, we'll be able to sign post you to services that can help you tackle it. So remember, you know, it's good to talk about these things as well and understand what sort of coping function these things have. Big thing, and a lot of people perhaps maybe not know about it, but cutting, cu cutting out caffeine can be also quite detrimental uh, to obviously your lifestyle. Um, and it, we know that there is no single diet proven to relieve symptoms of chronic pain or fibromyalgia. Uh, however, it is important to find good enough balance with the eating, making sure we've got regular fuel. Um, and some of some people with chronic pain and fibro can have problems, of course, with multitasking and short-term memory. So this can impact the cooking. And again, it is important that think, we think about that, add that to a pain and fatigue and of course the low energy and it can often lead to less healthy convenience foods. Therefore, it is really important for you to have a think of planning, as well as involving others, such as family or carers, to make sure you have the fuel you need. Um, and we know that also it is a fact that people uh, who present with fibromyalgia tend to have low levels of vitamin D, um, that could worsen your pain and other symptoms. It, excuse me, there, it is important perhaps for you to think about, speak to your doctor, maybe a blood test can be done uh, so you can measure your uh, vitamin D levels and get a supplement that you need. Um, in terms of going back to avoiding caffeine, uh, what I wanted to mention to you uh, is that, well, it can make us feel more alert it can also put you on edge and make it harder to sleep. And I will go back to sleep later on, but sleep is really important when you're struggling with chronic pain. Therefore, drinking, and we also know that drinking four or more cups of a caffeinated beverage a day has been linked with more fibro pain. Uh, so really having to think about, you know, what would be kind of useful for you. Okay, so moving on. Uh, exercise. Okay, so this one is very much something we would definitely have quite a lot of um a lot of sort of reservations around. So what I would always say, tune into your body and listen to what it's saying. Your body knows more than you think, and you are doing yourself a disservice if you don't listen to it. If your body is telling you that an activity is making you feel worse, maybe it's time to stop that activity and ask for a little bit of help. Maybe keeping a journal can help you realize which activities just aren't worth the pain in the end. When you have debilitating fatigue and pain that gets worse every time you exert yourself, it seems ridiculous to suggest exercise. The important thing to know about exercise though is that it doesn't need to involve hours of sweating it out at the gym. That doesn't work for us. So instead, you need to find a comfortable level of exercise for you. If it's two minutes of stretching to start with, or even just two stretches, all counts. The key is to be consistent about it and not overexert yourself. So in general, look for low impact exercise options. For example, yoga, Pilates, walking and swimming, um, maybe over time you might be able to increase the amount you're able to do. And if not, that's okay, okay? Speak to our coaches about that if you're unsure. They will be able to advise this as well. Um, especially with certain conditions such as chronic pain or fibro or ME, even a few minutes of exercise can make you feel worse for a couple of days. That's because of a symptom called post-exertional malaise. 
which makes you unable to recover from exertion like most people do. So be sure to take it slowly and gently and back off if you if what you're doing makes you crash. Um, and again, it's just being very gentle, okay? And really kind of allowing yourself to make, uh, use your best judgment. Um, and of course, speak to professionals uh, because sometimes advice, getting advice from a professional can build up your confidence within this. Uh, we know that exercise is important for us, even though we have to be careful. Numerous studies show that proper levels of exercise can help alleviate fibromyalgia symptoms and increase the energy. So when your muscles are limber and toned, they tend to hurt less and be less prone to injury. And beyond that, we know exercise is good for our general health. Um, so really being mindful around that. So when we know being active isn't for your favorite idea when you're in pain, but being stagnant isn't helping your body and mind. Try doing gentle exercises like going for that walk or getting into a pool, but just moving it very gently. And you don't have to be a super superhero. You don't have to do it all. Everyone deserves a break. So give yourself some grace when you need to rest. Remember, it's okay to ask for help also from friends and family, just making sure you are gentle with yourself. And when we think about lifestyle changes, a lot of people have been kind of advising that patients who are diagnosed with fibromyalgia or chronic fa fatigue syndrome need to engage with some lifestyle changes. However, it is obviously a, a slow process. So it is really checking out for you what's comfortable and what's not and making sure that you understand, understand that so there is no one size fits all approach and it has to be very individual to your needs. Going into the next um, guidance, um, sleep, um, getting better sleep is a huge factor and we know that a key feature for all kind of chronic illnesses is on refreshing sleep. Whether we sleep 16 hours a day or just a few hours at a time, we don't feel rested. Those of us with fibromyalgia are especially prone to multiple sleep disorders on top of that, making quality sleep a rarity. Um, the cruel, cruel irony is that quality sleep is one of the best remedies for those conditions. Um, while we may not be able to solve all of our sleep issues, we can do a lot to improve the amount of quality of sleep. Some of your sleepless, uh, some of uh, some of your sleep issues might need um, medical attention. So if you have symptoms of sleep disorders, of course, speak to your doctor. They might suggest a sleep study to help sort out exactly what's going on. Getting proper treatment can make a big difference in how you sleep and, and feel. Getting a good night's sleep is a critical part of managing daily pain and preventing flare-ups with fibromyalgia. But all that pain can also make it harder to fall asleep. And let's not forget about fibro's sinister symptom of insomnia. So a couple of tips, avoid stimulants and alcohol late in the day. So very much what I've said earlier, coffee, tea, chocolate, and many so many kind of um, fizzy drinks contain, of course, caffeine, which is the last thing you might need late in the day if you struggle with getting a good night's sleep. So you might consider reducing how much coffee you're drinking, even if the first part of the day. Uh, okay, so alcohol, on the other hand, is a depressant, but it can easily interfere with your sleep. So you might fall asleep more easily, but you probably won't feel rested in the morning. Um, sleeping in a dark, quiet room. So make sure your bedroom is, da is a dark and comfortable place. You look forward to seeking refuge in for the night. So sleeping in a cooler room has shown to help achieve a deeper sleep with plenty of warmth from blankets. So white noise machines can help clear out some subtle sound distraction. For some people, of course, listening to some soothing music uh, or an audio book can also help induce sleep. So play around for yourself. Whatever fits you, have a look at that. 
Some people choose to have a fan. Some people kind of choose to open a window. Some people actually prefer to have a quite warm room. So it is, again, very individual for you. Taking a bath or shower before bed with fibromyalgia, we're definitely more sensitive to cold temperatures. In the winter, it can be especially helpful to take a hot bath or shower right before bed. So definitely you're letting your muscles relax and feel a little bit more comfortable. So again, but there's also people who find it useful to have some colder compresses on. So really explore what is worthy for you to try. Um, try a little massage. If you live with a spouse or a partner, maybe ask him or her to give you a gentle massage before bed and help relax your painful muscles. You can also try small portable back massagers that you can place on your own, on your own sort of couch or recliner in a chair and try that this way. So again, going into the next one, which is uh, try some light stretching or vinyasa. So light stretching or even short and gentle vinyasa yoga routine uh, can help you relax those tense muscles, especially if you focus on taking deep, long breaths because this is all relaxing. So for insomnia, lying in bed wide awake for two hours despite feeling completely exhausted is cruel and frustrating. So working gently through a few minutes of some salutations can help ease these frustrations and give your mind a reprieve from overall stress or insomnia. So have a look out there. What sort of online resources on yoga are there? Maybe have a Google of vinyasas. Um, have a look if this is something your body can do and if this is something you can implement into your routine. Again, this is a suggestion. Find out what works for you best. Um, creating a relaxing music playlist. Create a playlist of songs that give you the most pleasant, peaceful feeling. So combine your favorite sleepy tunes with a no white noise machine or a dark, cool room and thick, thick flannel comforter. And you just might have all the ingredients you need to make falling asleep with fibro as delightful as possible. But again, it might be something that is so individual. Uh, picking up a good book. So that's self-explanatory. Have a look if this is something that works for you. Some people struggle with reading. So looking into perhaps audiobook or something a little bit more uh, soothing. Uh, giving up on sleeping and getting out of bed. Sometimes it is very much the best thing to do. Uh, and for the worst cases of insomnia or pain is to stop staring, in, st staring or turning around in bed, getting more and more frustrated. So get up and do something productive. The goal is to go of the desperate desire to sleep, distract yourself and get back into bed in a couple of minutes or 30, uh, 30 minutes or so. So if you really are struggling, you've been tossing and turning, just get out of bed, walk around, get a glass of water, perhaps allow yourself to, to kind of take away, uh, take your mind away from that pressure to sleep uh, and then come back again to it. Speaking to a therapist, speaking to a counselor or a psychotherapist can be useful uh, about your sleep issues. So allowing yourself to figure it out what kind of works best for you. Okay. Uh, anyone, of course, who's living with chronic and debilitating illness has come to um, terms with their health imposed limitations and, and changes. And this can be really hard. Accepting of your illness can be hard. Uh, because illnesses like this can make us feel afraid or insecure and hopeless and depressed and bad about ourselves. Just as we need to learn pacing techniques and improve our diets, we need to develop also good coping skills. Um, so this might mean changing your outlook on things. And a lot of people need help making that adjustment. Therefore, professional therapies can really help. This is you working through grief, working through the sense of loss of how your body used to be. So really being very mindful of how your um how your mental health is and what you would like to perhaps uh, address. Um, most of the therapies that are recommended within uh, UK are cognitive behavior therapies, but there is uh, a huge uh, 
number of choice of different therapies can be helpful. So allowing yourself to find out what therapy would be useful for you uh, um, and having it to go. And of course, if you want to speak to one of our teams around different therapies, what in our service or external to service, do that, we will be able to advise you. And again, therapy can be really helpful because it, what it does, it's, it really helps us to uh, recognize and address maybe past traumas or unhelpful thinking patterns. Uh, and that mental health counseling can begin to introduce helpful coping skills. Um, sometimes we might be finding ourselves, you know, obviously with chronic pain, but also uh, struggling perhaps with coping and coping with food or coping with other, like let's say, smoking or alcohol. Uh, we do need to find a good balance. Therefore, kind of talking to a professional will be really useful. Um, so most, of course, patients, do not understand the importance of um, kind of uh, sort of how do we break um, the, and disrupt the pain cycle. So coping skills such as pacing, appropriate limit setting and increased communication skills can minimize or eliminate pain. Remember that saying no to certain things, saying no to maybe some, um, some pressures or, of what people have been telling you to do it is also kind of can be a very much that kind of caring, uh, caring and gentle way of, of really looking after yourself. So remember that being assertive is also really important. So this is why I'm kind of bringing in the coping and managing stress because stress very much exer uh, exacerbates symptoms of many pain, um, many pain symptoms and having chronic illness can add a lot of stress to your life. And it's important to learn how, how to lower your stress levels and deal better with the stress that uh, uh, you can eliminate. eliminate. So having a look at the uh, kind of self-care, a uh, very much self-care uh, techniques. And as I, I've mentioned earlier around acceptance, reaching acceptance, applying some self-compassion, but also kind of very much the practical things um, allowing your body to perhaps uh, really engage in activities such as, for example, soaking your body in a bath uh, and really allowing your body to feel comforted by that bath. We know we know that uh, heat can increase endorphins, um, which can, of course, block pain signals and, and can, can help you sleep a little bit better. Taking some time for you every day, maybe looking into... Um, Kind of couple of minutes of journaling or listening to that song that you really enjoy really taking your me time every day um and as i said earlier saying no there's something about being okay to simply say no and saying no to others means saying yes to yourself and you deserve to look after you and sometimes you know being kind of uh, almost uh, feeling the pressure that I've got to look after everybody else might not be quite helpful to you. Um, maybe keeping a daily journal and have a look if this is something kind of useful. Sometimes with, with chronic pain conditions, we forget quite a lot. So really kind of being so quite maybe regular with noting down what is it that I would like to do? What is it like, to, you know, what's my plan for the day? Just so you can keep a track of what's going on and how you can look after yourself a little bit better. Remember that being consistent with, uh, with the changes and being consistent with activities can really make a difference to how you're feeling. So explore self-care activities like meditation, you know, listening to music, as I've mentioned earlier, some of the physical activities, you know, there's so much ideas there. I have also we have also kind of produced uh, a little booklet um so if you want to have a look at the booklet and uh, look at the summary of some of the ideas please do uh, and let us know if there's anything else that you might want to add into it so just to kind of summarize this point about coping skills and stress management just it's about little things which have massive impact so you sometimes might think just uh, seemingly little things in your daily life can obviously exacerbate your symptoms. Little changes to your daily life can help sometimes alleviate them. This could mean maybe changing the way you dress, for example. 
um finding way or finding ways to keep yourself from getting too hot or too cold so no matter how bizarre or trivial your particular issues may seem someone else with these conditions has dealt with it as well that's why also it's is so so important to learn from each other which brings us to the last point that i'd like to share with you which is joining a support group Support groups can play an important part in the lives of people with chronic illnesses, whether it's in person, and of course we know post-pandemic, there's a lot more online happening and there's a lot of different groups or, or in social media groups as well, or events happening that are organized with different fibromyalgia uh, uh, organizations. So explore for yourself. What's there? Uh, I've left a link here on my slides. So if you want to take it down and come back to the slide as well, have a look at this. Maybe there is something in that group, in that link that could be useful. But remember, support groups provide that emotional support, information and tips for coping. And you might feel that actually there's more people with you on the same board or on the same boat that would like to uh, also seek some support. So sometimes talking to others might be useful. And you might spend most of your time alone or at home or feel distance from other people because of your illness. And it's so hard to find people in our lives who truly understand what we're going through. Therefore, certain support groups in your community or online, you can find people who will understand and support you. That support can help you feel less alone, improve your outlook and find new treatments and management techniques. So when you're thinking about um, looking after you and looking after your, your lifestyle, um, it is really important that you think about very much those tiny little changes, being consistent. It takes around 60 days to develop a habit. That's why we do need to be very much uh, consistent but also give ourselves time you know if you're in pain maybe have a look at the spoon theory maybe that's something that you can um you can use and apply to to wherever you are but i'd like you to really think about some of these guidances from this presentation today and really think about yourself as a human being who really does need a little bit more looking after and be really gentle changing lifestyle or being told to lose weight is not an easy thing to do. That's why we do need to pace ourselves one step at a time. And we in our service will do everything that we can to support you. And we will look at your issues or your presentation from a multidisciplinary perspective. And please don't be afraid to speak to us. We are here to listen. And we are here to make sure you're also looked after, okay? And just before I end, I just wanted to thank you for listening and I hope you found some of it useful and very much thank you and take care of yourself.